A century of feminism and relations between men and women remain a fraught topic. Author Laura Kipnis knows that all too well. Last year, facing angry protests at her own university for a probing essay she wrote. Undaunted, she joins us now to talk about her new book. It's called Men, Notes from an Ongoing Investigation. And with that, we welcome Laura Kipnis, professor at Hi. Northwestern University in Chicago, who joins us now from New York City. And it's a delight to have you back on the program. You were on, uh, oh, I guess it was about eight years ago for the first time. So here's you and I having yet another conversation. And yet we never meet. <laughs> thank you for having me. And thank you for that undaunted. I like that as a, <laughs> as a logo. It's a pleasure to have you back on. I'm going to start with a, a rather lengthy excerpt from your book, so get comfortable for a second. And I guess I have to, okay. I mean, there, there are some parts of the book where you use fairly blue language. This is really minor league blue language, I'm, but I, I do feel an obligation since we're on in prime time to sort of warn parents, hide your kids' ears for just a second. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Now that men have become less economically necessary and there's less reason than ever to pretend to admire them, scorn for men has become the post-feminist fallback position widely regarded as a badge of feistiness and independence. Nevertheless, men remain conduits to things a lot of women still deeply want. Sex, love, babies, commitments. It's a contradictory situation. But get a bunch of women in a room, add liquor, and jokes about men's inadequacies fly like shrapnel. When it comes to dating, single men are dogs, infants, sex-obsessed, moral rodents, or emotional incompetence. And once you finally land one, Nothing much improves, since husbands are morons, selfish, workaholics, emotionally unavailable, and domestically unavailable. Single men lie and mislead to get sex. Husbands have lost interest in sex entirely. Men are emotionally autistic, except for all the ones who want you to be their mother. Men can't talk about their feelings, except for the ones who won't shut up about them. They're macho assholes, except when they're wimps. <laughs> Okay, well, Laura, get off the fence and tell us what you really think, first of all. Um, <laughs> I want to say that I was just channeling the culture here. I right. myself am, you know, have completely benign feelings toward all men. I, it's a point worth clarifying that you're not actually saying this, but you are sort of reflecting what is certainly out there in the zeitgeist about this. Did women feel differently about men when they were economically more dependent upon them? I don't know if they felt differently, but I guess there were less uh, venues for expression or less freedom for expression. I mean, if you read somebody like Dorothy Parker, although, of course, she was economically independent herself, but, I mean, you can read people from the all the generations, women, I mean, all the generations of the 20th century, and hear those kinds of things, at least in the subtext, if not stated, you know, so... Uh, forthrightly. So, I, I mean, I think these are recognizable feelings. I think they're just, they're probably stated more openly now. There seems to be a lot of scorn, though, that is a regular feature of the post-feminist position. Why do you think that is? I do think that there's this sense of being fed up with men that you hear articulated a lot more. I mean, it may have something to do with the economic, more economic independence. Um, but I think it also has something to do with changes in male culture as well, in ways that men um, have become more, uh, more independent themselves and less likely to sign on for some of the traditional roles that I think a lot of women actually still want them to play, like, you know, fiancé or committed husband or, or breadwinner. And some of those changes are economic, but I, I do think that there are changes in men's willingness to depart from these traditional narratives, too. So there's maybe more mismatch between the sexes in terms of, you know, getting together to share some sort of common narrative. But you don't dislike men, and yet you do write some stuff in here about men in your book, Men, that no man could get away with writing about women, right? Um, I don't know. Have you read a novel lately? I mean, I think there are, say, a lot of male novelists who say incredibly scathing things about women. I mean, read Philip Roth or John Updike. I mean, these are great chronicles, chroniclers of male dissatisfaction with, with women. Saul Bellow, who's, you know, actually one of my, my favorite writers. So, I, you know, I guess it depends on, on the venue, but, you know, I think men have been scathing about women over the years. Okay, but you write here, what strikes me most about these essays is my covert end envy of men, um, including ones that I would like to thrash and dismember. That, mm -hmm. that, that's a little, I mean, that's a little 
close to the edge there, isn't it, Laura? Oh, gosh, I thought that was affectionate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you know, as I said, like, you know, wasn't so much trying to be polite as to articulate things that I, I suppose run kind of deep for me. And I don't think I'm alone. So I think to some extent I'm um, speaking things that most women feel somewhere. I mean, I do think, you know, if we're, I mean, let's just get off the pretense about it. I mean, I think for men and women both, particularly in the context of heterosexual relations, you know, there's, like I said, a lot of mutual disappointment and various kinds of antagonisms that, that get expressed in, in different sorts of ways. You know, the passage you read at the, at the beginning um, is a way that, you know, women in the guise of joking about men and their failures ex express disappointment. But, you know, like look at a New Yorker cartoon or stand-up comedians. You know, they're saying a lot of the same stuff. So there are these different venues and, and contexts where a lot of this gets articulated. Okay, you do have a line, though, that I think I need some clarification on, which is women take men too seriously and not seriously enough. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Well, the disappointment, I mean, if you read it, uh, okay, here's a fancy word, like dialectically, I mean, you know, it, it, the expression of disappointment is also an expression of a desire for something that's not being fulfilled. So I think that, you know, again, in the context of heterosexual culture, there is on the part of women this desire for men to fulfill us, to play a role in our lives, you know, in our romantic lives, in our futures, um, in our domestic lives, all of that. And, you know, to the extent that men are willing to play along, okay, that's great. But I do think more and more, because of a lot of shifting um, issues in the culture at large, the economic shifts, um, women entering the professions, you know, all sorts of stuff, women leaving marriages at higher rates. There just are these, there's a kind of level of fractiousness and, and mutual senses, I think, of, you know, not getting what you want from the other person. And, you know, I think that from, from the opposite sex, let's say. So I guess I was trying to articulate that um, while also acknowledging, you know, this line you read about me saying I was envious of men, I mean, I am envious of a lot of the kinds of freedoms that men have had over the years at all levels, you know, the mm -hmm. kinds of mobility, um, creative sorts of freedoms. You know, I mentioned authors I admire like Saul Bellow. I mean, he's an amazing writer and also like at a lot of moments really pretty misogynist. You know, so that is a kind of freedom to hmm. say what is really in your psyche. You used the word disappointment, though, a few times already. And I, I, let me just follow up on that. I, and I'll throw this out as a theory. You tell me what you think. Women are so disappointed in men because there just aren't men who are princely, resourceful, confident, make a good living, not threatened by strong women, uh, only have eyes for the woman that he is with. Um, in other words, the perfect guy just doesn't exist, never has, never will, and as a result, women are disappointed. Fair comment? Well, I, I like to avoid stupid generalizations. <laughs> you know, so it's like my great goal in life is not to, make, not to overgeneralize. I mean, I guess, you know, it's, it's an issue for all of us that people are contradictory, including the people we end up with as mates or, you know, life partners or whatever you want to call it, spouses. Um, I mean, that's a tough thing to deal with, are the sort of failures of another person to, to be who you want them to be. And so I guess I'm being ironic about those failures throughout the book, um, but, you know, they're, they're real. I mean, I think we all have these kinds of um, not realistic desires of, of other people, and, you know, that accounts for a lot of, say, like the marital discord that you see around us. Okay. Well, one of the things I kind of liked was your, um, I guess confession is, is an okay word to use here, that you are, quote, drawn to men. You are drawn to excess to men who laugh too loud, drink too much, who are temperamentally and romantically immoderate, have off-kilter politics and ideas. Uh, after as many books as you've written now, do you have any idea why you're drawn to such uh, disreputable characters? 
I think because I'm such a demure person, you know, that's it's like the it's my other the side of myself that I keep under wraps, I guess. I, I mean, I can only speculate because I think those sorts of deep uh, you know, parts of yourself are, are not maybe ones you have access to. But I mean, I guess I've, you know, gotten along enough in years that I can look back and see a sort of pattern. Well, so. I, I, I should have rushed to the dictionary to understand the next thing that you wrote here, but I didn't. So because I figured I'll just oh, ask sorry. you directly. You call some of these men, is it phallocratic divas? Phallocratic, yeah. Phallocratic um, divas. What does yeah. that mean? Well, I, you know, there, I guess it's a bit of an academic term about the phallus, you know, being central, I mean, which would be phallocentric, and phallocratic would be like an autocrat, the ph elevating the phallus to the, <laughs> you know, king, kingly position that, of course, you know, men would want it to be in. And how different is that kind of male diva from his female counterpart? Well, I, I mean, that's, it's, a, it's funny that you pick on that phrase because to my mind, there's a, a, a humor in the formulation because a diva is, we think of a female a figure, right? Like the opera diva. So to call a man a diva is already kind of like feminizing him, but to call him a phallocratic diva actually gave me a great pleasure because I think it's a, a, a new uh, oxymoron. So I, what you're picking out is, in fact, like a mishmash of, of gender positions that don't exactly go together, but yet I, I thought were funny. It's like like, to, like the term male hysteric, which is another term I'm fond of. Hmm. You know, we think of hysteria as a female trait. So if you call somebody a phallocratic, hysterical, you know, male diva, like that would be a whole bunch of interesting roles to occupy. Got to confess, one of the more interesting um, chapters in the book, I thought, was where you said some pretty nice things about a guy named Larry Flint. Now, Larry Flint, to the best of my knowledge, publishes one of the raunchiest, most uh, misogynistic <laughs> magazines in American history, Hustler Magazine. So I am, mm -hmm. I am curious to follow up on what qualities he has that you find so uh, interesting and compelling. Well, I should say that I have a weird history with Larry Flint. Um, I had, had written about him. I got very interested in Hustler magazine um, and the ways that it uses class and kind of circulates a sort of class antagonism using pornography as a sort of attack on the elites, on like bourgeois proprieties, and particularly feminist proprieties. And I thought at, at the time I was writing, the, the feminist anti-pornography movement was very big, and I thought they were not taking account of class and the kinds of, the ways that class circulates in a, in a magazine like Hustler. So I wrote this essay, which it got read a lot because nobody was talking about these issues at the time. And weirdly, it got read by Larry Flint. His ghostwriter, I guess, gave it to him. And so I heard from his ghostwriter that Larry had read this essay and liked it. And if I wanted to meet him, if I was in L.A. to drop by. So I did end up, end up meeting him. And then also, weirdly, the ghostwriter in writing Larry's autobiography used some of the stuff from my essay about him and put it in Larry's a voice, so as if Larry was saying the things that I had said about him in the essay. So one of the things I say in the piece was that I wish all men had been so susceptible to like adopting my fantasies about them. You know, I sort of fantasized about who I thought he should be, and then he went along with it, which you know I thought was a sort of char was charming on his part. So I wrote a few other things about him over the years and, and met him a, a few times, and. I just became fascinated with him as a, as a figure because he's, um, you know, uses pornography in these kind of political ways in in ways that have a long history, going back to the to the origins of print culture, where pornography was this political um, uh, like idiom to attack higher ups, like elites, like kings, and you know, the church. So there's a tradition of political pornography that I saw Hustler as like continuing. Well, of course. So anyway, he, so Larry I, does fascinate me. Right, and and uh, you know he had that uh, of course significant free speech case before the Supreme Court of the United States, and yeah, and I, I, yeah. I mean I, I have to ask you about another man who is exercising his free speech rights these days, as perhaps, you know, no one has in in decades and decades in American political life, and that's Donald Trump. Uh, does he fall into one of those? categories of men that you find very compelling? 
Gosh, uh, that's a tough question. I weirdly have been working on a book on narcissism, which I keep putting aside to, to write other things. And of course, you know, I had the line at one point before his presidential uh, campaign that he was like the patient zero of, of narcissism. But it's such a cliche to say that now it's, the, you know, what everyone says about him or that he's the id of the Republican Party. Um, you know, I find him scary and, of course, symptomatic of a lot of the problems in American, uh, you know, culture, obviously having to do with immigration and, and race and, and all of these things. I guess at some level, all of these figures, like Larry Flint included, were figures that compelled me in some way, you know, that spoke to something in me that, you know, I couldn't articulate. And I just don't see any of that with Donald Trump. There's just no point of connection that I, I have with him. Uh, he doesn't fascinate me, he kind of repels me. So he's not somebody I think I could write about or, you know, have anything interesting to say about, obviously. How about Bill Clinton? Clinton. You know, now you're now you're talking my language. Uh, you know, Clinton's incredibly charismatic. And, you know, again, a lot of the cliches are that it stems from his own neediness, his, his need to be loved. But everybody I know has been in a room with Clinton and I've met, you know, so, some of these people talks about the Clinton effect. And I guess there is something about charm or charisma. And Larry Flint, I've found to be very charming. And in his way, you know, he's, if your uh, uh, viewers don't know, he's been st stuck in a wheelchair for the last 20 or 30 years. Um, I mean, but despite being, as he would put it, a, a cripple, you know, he's a, a very charismatic kind of figure, as is Clinton. And I think maybe a lot of the people I wrote about, there was something charismatic about them that interested me. You've got an essay on, quote, men who hate Hillary, and you write of her as being a, quote, sophisticated diagnostic instrument for calibrating male anxiety. Tell us what you mean by that. Mm -hmm. Well, I spent quite some time reading almost every right-wing biography of Hillary <laughs> that I could find, um, including one that came with its like own voodoo doll, you know, and was had a subtitle like "Stick Her Before She Sticks You." So I mean, I I was in the trenches with these right wing biographies, and the thing that I found, which was kind of fascinating, is just every single one of them didn't talk about her politics so much as they talked about her bodily inadequacies, you know, her calves and her hair and her you know, lumpy this and lumpy that. And, you know, there was just this, it was almost like I made a joke about opening, expecting to turn the page and find a catalog of her moles as a, you know, insight into her uh, political programs. So there was something about the attention to her body as this almost like smothering, threatening entity for these these guys who were also all very whipped up you know, politically about what kind of threat that she posed uh, that, in, that interested me and interested me, you know, in an almost psychoanalytic way about males' uh, fear of the smothering mother, the all-empowering mother. And it did seem symptomatic of the way that power relations uh, have changed. I mean, this prospect of a woman running the world is very, uh, you know, quite possible at this point, and I think it is very threatening for a lot of men. I mean, I still think there is something psychoanalytic about um, the ways that, you know, men grow up with mothers, for the most part, who rule their lives, their bodies, rule the domestic sphere, and the idea of a woman ruling the, you know, geopolitical sphere as well, I think just does provoke these kind of weird hysterical responses. Let's nudge our way over to saying the unsayable, because oh, okay. you've had some experience with this that I want to touch on right now. One of your early books, earlier books rather, was called How to Become a Scandal. And uh, almost as if prophetic, you became enmeshed in a bit of a scandal yourself when you published an essay earlier this year entitled Sexual Paranoia Strikes Academe. Uh, what exactly was it that you wrote that caused so much Sturm and Drang, as they say? <laughs> Oh, good pronunciation. <laughs> well, I was writing about the um, new, what are called consensual relations policies on my campus, meaning professors and students being prohibited from dating. And then beyond that, this kind of climate 
uh, this was about a year ago, um, having to do with these increasing, this increasing sense of like victimization that students have and wanting to be protected from things that would offend them. You know, the idea of trigger warnings was, was in the news a lot then, and I'd had some experience with it. So, so I wrote this essay, and it was in a kind of ironic tone, and it was in a, a magazine called The Chronicle of Higher Education, which is something that mostly I thought uh, professors and, and campus administrators read. So uh, then the next thing I hear is a few days after the essay came out, uh, there was a protest march by students on my campus. Um, they were marching to the president's office with a petition, I guess demanding that I be censured or that the university stand up and defend its policies against my attack. And the, they were not just protesting, they were carrying mattresses and pillows which had been this become this symbol of student on student sexual assault because of the Columbia case, the girl that was carrying around the mattress, uh, mattress girl. So, uh, you know, this was all very weird because I actually had not been writing about the student on student assault. So how did the university respond to all of this? This is Northwestern in Chicago we're talking about, right? Yeah, okay. Evanston, um, which is outside of Chicago. Okay. Well. I mean, the whole thing was a kind of, kind of odd because, I mean, I, I, I assume that when I heard about this protest that there wasn't going to be an issue because there is this thing called academic freedom, and I am tenured, luckily, meaning job security. So the, the Title IX situation, just to try to summarize briefly what it is, especially for people out of the U.S., it's, you know, this, this federal, the federal government and, and the Department of Education have got this thing called Title IX, which is supposed to prevent gender discrimination on campuses, but it's expanded to deal with sexual assault. And what happened was these students pressed charges trying to, I guess, expand what Title IX would cover to include the idea that this article that I wrote had created a hostile environment to, to them. So that was, if, if that's clear enough. And sure. so the university hired these outside lawyers because universities are threatened with losing federal funding if they don't comply with Title IX. So they hired these outside lawyers. They spent 72 days. I mean, this has got to be like $100,000. I don't know. I'm bad at estimating legal costs. But I mean, they ended up producing two single space 60 page reports uh, clearing me of the charges. But, you know, after quite a long time, and I wrote a second essay about having been brought up on Title IX charges, and nobody has actually written about this because you're threatened with losing your job if you disclose these kinds of charges which are supposed to be confidential. If you didn't have tenure, do you think you might have been fired over this? I don't think at my university I would have been t uh, fired, but other... I mean, since this essay came out, I've just gotten dozens and dozens of letters from people at other places that have been brought up on similar charges, and they're terrified to speak out. And people at uh, smaller colleges that are more kind of under the thumb of, like, administration and presidents have been fired for things like swearing in class. So there's just this whole new level of ways in which administrators are trying to protect students and students are demanding to be protected that it has ended up endangering faculty in terms of jobs. Hmm. So let's finish up on this then. We, we, we are now in an era on university campuses all over North America where, and I, and I don't mean to say this in a disparaging way, I hope people won't infer that from what I'm about to say, but we are into a new era of trigger warnings and safe spaces and that kind of thing on university campuses now. And I wonder whether you think something um, you know, historically negative is happening as a result of the new era we seem to find ourselves in in the post-secondary world. I do think it's negative, and I use the term McCarthyism, new McCarthyism, in, I think, the Title IX essay because um, the, the demands to not adhere to free speech or academic freedom that are increasing, I think, are incredibly threatening and, and short-sighted. And I understand there are political debates about free speech encroaching on, say, protections uh, for, for minority students. And, you know, I think that's a longer debate than, than we can get into here. Mm -hmm. But I do think that what's weird about this moment is the way that ad campus administrators are kind of siding with these student activists to quash faculty uh, 
dissension. And, and that, I think, is, is very disturbing. And, you know, I got caught up in the middle of that myself, and it's made me feel more like an activist. I mean, I'm somebody who writes, you know, essays like in the Men book, and I've never been much of an activist, but having heard the kinds of things I've heard from people around the country about what's happening, and it's all happening behind closed doors. It's not publicized. I sort of do feel like I have to write more about this. Well, when you do, I look forward to reading it. And we're really grateful you came on Thank TVO you. for so much time with us tonight. Uh, last time we had you on was about eight years ago. Uh, we look forward um, to doing this again sometime in person. What do you sooner say? Sooner than eight years. Yes, and I would love to. sooner than eight years. That would be good, too. Yes. Thanks so much, Laura Kipnis, for joining us on the line from New York City. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.